Hey you, welcome back to my channel for our Plant Therapy Thursday session where we enter the plant kingdom and explore weird and beautiful plants from around the world from relaxing rainforest plants to sculptural desert cacti and succulents. Welcome back you guys for today's Plant Therapy Thursday session. We're going to be going over the Monstera Deliciosa. I'll share basic care tips and then also we'll do a complete repotting. So I'll share everything that I do when I repot one of these and this one is about five feet right now but it is still a juvenile plant so I want to get it into a lighter weight pot and so that's kind of my mission today. And first I just realized that um, before I turned on the camera I realized oh wait um, I don't have an extra stake to use for this so I'm gonna have to make one so let's just just go and do that on camera too. Okay, so to make our plant steak, you're gonna need just a few items and there's all kinds of ways you can make a steak. So it, you can find even just a stick. You don't even have to use, actually, yeah, you could just use one item to make a steak. You could go find a branch outside and use that as your steak. So there's all kinds of ways to do this. But I like to make the cocoa core poles. So I've got a piece of cocoa core here. It's just the cocoa fiber and it's kind of matted and pressed together. So you can buy this in rolls you can buy it in rolls or by the foot actually so I couldn't find any rolls in my area uh, lately I've been looking all over the place and everywhere is sold out so all the nurseries and everything so I just found this last little piece at Green Things a plant nursery here in Tucson so I bought the last of what they had and I'm gonna cut this in half and really try to stretch it so I can get two poles or two stakes out of it and then for the stake itself I'm just using a two by two so let's get making this right now so the first thing I'm gonna do is cut this piece of cocoa fiber in half so long ways because I want to get two pieces out of it to make two pulls because I got more plants that are waiting to get they're like on a waiting list for steaks right now and you can cut the cocoa fiber just with a regular pair of scissors okay so I've got one piece and I've got my pull or my steak and I'm just gonna wrap that around it so it's just gonna wrap around once if you wanted a really thick pole and you can, or a really thick steak, you can wrap it around multiple times if you want. But the cocoa fiber just gives extra kind of depth for any roots to kind of cling to and kind of if they want to get in there or hold on, it just kind of helps them hold on. Okay, so we've got our steak and the cocoa core fiber. And so normally I like to wrap the top too. You don't have to though. You could have the wood go or your steak go all the way to the top and just wrap it like that and have the top exposed but I like to wrap the top, so normally I just pull extra few inches and then pull that over. And then you just wrap it like a little burrito, basically. And normally I won't worry about the rest because that's kind of hard to try to do the whole thing at once. Normally I'll just do the top and I'll take my twine and then I'll start there and then work my way wrapping the twine down and around it. So that's how I make these. And for the twine, I'm just using this. This is um, uh, artificial sinew. So it's just really strong and it's kind of a waxy, uh, waxy cord. So it holds on really good. And then it also matches the cocoa uh, core pretty well. And so I'm just gonna pull off a bunch of the twine. And I normally have to use several feet of this because I do a crisscross when I'm wrapping it. And it kind of takes a lot of it. And I fold my twine in half. So I've got the center of it here. Let's just wrap that again. And then I wrap that around the back. And I do crisscrosses all the way down. So I just crisscross it, wrap it around the back. So hopefully you can see there, I just crisscross over the front wrap it around the back, do a crisscross there also. And as I'm crisscrossing and working my way down, I just work a few inches at a time. So I don't worry about all this down here. I just close it up a few inches at a time. So normally when I'm wrapping a steak, I find it's easiest to be sitting down in a chair and then have the steak in front of you just sitting on the floor. And then you're wide open to be able to wrap, you know, around the back and the front really easily. And you're able to work your, your twine. Uh, much easier than if it's laying down on a flat surface, but I wanted to make sure you guys were able to see what I was doing. So that's one way to make it easier, sitting down and having the pole standing on the floor so you can work freely around it. Or another way is to have it kind of sitting off of a table. So have it on a table and then you can kind of either brace it with your leg as you're wrapping around, just so you have more free movement all the way around to do the back wraps. And you can always brace it if you have to. 
And so we're just finishing up here. Actually, I'm gonna make that the last twist right there. Okay, so we're all done wrapping, so now I'm just gonna tie a knot at the bottom to secure it. So Monstera deliciosas are native to tropical areas. So they originate from southern Mexico in the tropical regions, Central America, like Honduras, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, uh, also down into South America, as well as they've also made their way into some of the islands, like they're in Hawaii and also Seychelles. These are actually really tough plants, and what's interesting about them is that they are able to make it in a wide range of climates also, even though they are originally native to the tropics. But they do have a preferred type of climate where they can really thrive and do their best. They love high humidity, so if you think about the tropics, um, these are an epiphytic vine, so they climb up trees just like the Monstera adansonii's. So they climb up and they use these aerial roots to kind of clutch around the trees as they're climbing and they are absolutely stunning when you see them in their mature state. They actually get quite a bit more splits in the leaves and it's just gorgeous. Now this, well actually, actually all of these, all of the plants that I have are not mature, they're just juveniles. Um, but this one actually, even though it's smaller, it was a cutting from a larger plant, a more mature plant. And so every time it puts out leaves, they're more formed. Like you can see this one has uh, more splits or fenestrations in the leaves compared to this one. This plant is bigger. This is about five feet, maybe, yeah, about four and a half to five feet wide. Um, but this one is still putting out smaller leaves that have, uh, you know, only a few, you know, a handful of fenestrations. But as they mature, they start getting even more fenestrations and they just create these beautiful designs in the leaves. So these guys love to be warm, they love high humidity, and they love a lot of moisture. They love contact with a lot of moisture. And that can be, you know, like spray over the leaves, like it, you can actually mist these. In fact, I've got my mister around here somewhere. So they absolutely love getting misted, and we'll just give it a little mist right now because I'm sure it's probably hot. <laughs> and it's, we're in the desert here, so it's hot and dry. Okay, we're gonna get mixing up our soil recipe, and this is the same soil recipe that I used in the Monstera adansonii potting up. Um, so it's the, you know, they're both aeroids, they both have the same epiphytic uh, vining, you know, that they both, they both do the same thing, um, and they're both from the tropics, so they have very similar requirements. So that's why I'm doing the same exact potting soil recipe. Um, so the soil that I'm gonna be using here, this is happy frog, it has humic acid. It also has, uh, I think it, is it mycorrhiza? Mycorrhizae, I think it's mycorrhizae, soil microbes in it already. It also has fertilizer. Okay, so in the happy frog soil, um, I'm gonna read off the ingredients to you guys because I always like to let you know the ingredients and why I'm using that particular product and putting that into the soil recipe. So ingredients in the happy frog potting mix is 50 to 60% aged forest products, sphagnum peat moss, perlite, and fertilizer. So a lot of tropicals, including monsteras, they do like a peat-based potting soil, and so that's why I'm using this one. Normally, if I'm potting up anything else like cactus or succulents or something, I, I never use anything that has peat in it. But because I know that these monsteras, you know, they're tropical, they do like that extra rich uh, peat-based potting soil, I will use it just for them. So we've got our one part potting soil, and that adds the moisture retentive part of our soil recipe. In this bag, I have a blend of three ingredients. So so I've got cocoa chips, hummus, and cocoa peat. So it's just a little bit of cocoa peat in there. It's mostly the chips and the pumice. So that's gonna serve as our aerated part of our soil recipe. So we're doing one part of our cocoa-based gritty mix to our one part of potting soil. Okay, I've got this long fibered sphagnum moss I'm gonna add to our soil recipe here. And this holds 20 times its weight in water. So this is also gonna be one of our moisture retentive ingredients. And I'm just gonna put in maybe like, maybe like three handfuls of it. I'm also gonna use this activated charcoal. I got this at Walmart in the aquarium section. Um, it, that's, that's where it was the cheapest that I could find it. So I'm just gonna add a little, I'm not measuring this, I'm just kind of like sprinkling in. So maybe just like about two handfuls worth of the activated charcoal. Let me bring you guys in a little bit closer because I want to show you the textures before I start mixing it. Okay, so I just want to show you guys some of the textures here that we have going on so you can see that this is definitely the moisture retentive part of our soil mix here. And then here we have our activated charcoal. 
that'll act as a filter. And I forgot to mention, activated charcoal will also hold on to nutrients. And so that's another reason I'm adding it to the soil. So it's a natural filter and it also holds on to nutrients. And then we have our sphagnum peat moss, long fibered sphagnum peat moss. So here's the sphagnum peat moss that I'm using. And you can find this in the orchid section of garden centers. So I got this at uh, Home Depot. Um, so it's just about like five bucks for a bag. So one tip about the sphagnum moss is it can kind of clump together. So we wanna break up those clumps and you can just break it up real quick. You don't have to be like really meticulous or anything. Just kind of separate it because since it does hold 20 times its weight in water, it is one of our moisture retaining ingredients. So that's why we wanna break it up. The, our plant roots will love finding little pockets of moisture within the soil, but we just don't wanna overwhelm it and have big uh, globs of moisture happening in the soil. So that's why we wanna just break it up a little, just the really big, you know, chunky bits. And another option that you could do, um, if you want it even smaller, you can just take some scissors and chop, 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 and chop it up even smaller. And then we have our gritty mix, which is mostly composed of cocoa chips and pumice, and there's a little bit of cocoa peat mix in there too. So Monstera deliciosas want a nice, rich soil, but they also want it to be fast draining because they are epiphytic plants, so they are climbing up trees and holding onto bark, so they don't necessarily want to be like buried in really heavy soil. And so far, since using this combination, I've found it to be a really good balance of retaining enough moisture, but still being very light. Oh, do we have another, another chunk of sphagnum moss there? Okay, so it looks like we've got a good texture going here for our Monstera Deliciosa. We are ready to pot it up. All right, guys, I'm back. We had a little bit of an intermission there. Michael got home and um, I was moving some stuff around here. So if you notice the background's a little different, uh, it's gonna be changing as I'm getting this set up more to be a regular filming area because it's gonna be our regular plant therapy room here. So, um, all right, we're, we're in our dining room, by the way, except our dining room has gotten push that our table is over on this side and this is gonna be like our little filming area. This thing has some very new aerial roots and I don't want to break any of them because I love the aerial roots that these put out and I wanna keep them as intact as possible. So I don't wanna get any snapping <laughs> as we're getting this out of its pot. All right, so let's try to get this out. So what I'm doing is just kind of scraping around the edges. Now, it is so much easier when you repot these from a plastic pot because then you can, you can roll it on its side and kind of like soften it up from the edges. But when it's in a ceramic pot, you kind of gotta like, you know, wedge your tools down in there and kind of like dig it out of there. And so right now I'm just starting with my hands, just kind of scraping around the edges. It's got such lovely new little starts. It's got like all these new little aerial roots just starting. They're only like a inch or two long, but they're like all over. So we're just working that root ball free and I'm just clearing away any of the soil that's around the outer edge of the root ball. It's just about out, but I'm just feeling for where the roots finally end. And I think they go down all the way to the bottom of the pot because I feel like they're holding on at the very bottom. <laughs> and I'm trying to work it free. Like my hands are around the whole root ball right now, but I just can't get around the very bottom of it to lift it out, you know what I mean? So we're, we're getting there. I'm just trying to be gentle on the roots and I don't want to break any like big old turnip roots, you know, down there at the very bottom. So we're not gonna rush it, we're just gonna take our time getting this out. We're just gonna scoot some of that old potting soil away and put my new pot in the side of our tree here. Okay, there we go. I think we got it. Yes, she is free. Okay, wait, okay. First, before we do any lifting or anything, take note of where you're holding and where the aerial roots are. Let's get a grip on the top here. Most of the growth is leaning over this way, so I'm just gonna support that with my arm. I don't wanna snap any roots at the last minute here. So, not bad, not bad. You know what, actually I am going to take out some of that soil. It's not a massive root system, but they have a lot of really good new white roots on there. So lots of, oops, sorry you guys. <laughs> lots of white roots. It's looking really good and healthy. They're just a little on the drier side than I want it. I want it to have more moisture. So that's why we're switching the mixes, the soil recipe. So we're gonna get it into this new soil mix. Now we're ready for the steak. So I've got a little bit of soil in there. 
And I've got the spot where I'm gonna put the steak, I've got that kind of dug away. So I'm just gonna work that down to the bottom of the pot. It's growing out, but I want it growing up this way. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna switch this around. Okay, so let's add a little bit of soil around the steak so that can kind of stand upright. Okay. I kinda, I kinda need to flip it around. Oops, sorry. This way. There we go. Get in. Oh, those roots are. Come on now, get in there. Well, those roots are super grabby. They grab onto everything. I think we got it in the right, at least the right position in the pot with the steak. So now I will just lift up the plant a tiny bit as we're putting in the soil. So normally what I do when I'm uh, backfilling, putting the soil back into the pot, I'm kind of holding the plant up. I'm just supporting it so it's not just like smashing its roots. I want the roots to kind of be, you know, able to face downwards. And I'm just sort of like lifting it up so the roots are just sort of like dangling there. And then as I drop in the soil, I just look for an opening and I keep dropping the soil into that one opening. And once it's in there, then I spread it around. Um, and I do it kind of like that because, and I'll shake a little too, and that just helps the soil kind of settle down in between those roots. And I just find that that's an easy way to get the roots um, kind of situated in there without getting, you know, kind of crushed or smashed under the plant. Okay, so I just mixed up some more soil and we're just going to finish back filling here. Get some more in the front. So I'm just tamping the soil around the stake a little more because I really want that to be nice and sturdy to be able to uh, support these, these bigger branches that we're going to be, or bigger vines. We're going to be uh, staking those up in just a minute here. So when we just potted this, I kind of tilted the plant up so it wasn't like splayed out kind of flatter. You know how it was before kind of reaching out to the sides? I kind of turned it upwards so it's almost like a fan shape now. And I just did that because I wanted to be able to get these bigger, heavier vines attached to the stake. So you just kind of got to play with your plant sometimes. And you know, if you have to reposition it, you know how it's growing uh, to get it up on a stake. Okay, one more shake. So this is what I'm using. It's kind of ribbon-like. It's artificial sinew, so that's what I use. Um, that's what I used on my other Adansonii. These branches are going to be much heavier than the Adansonii, so I'll just see how this works. And if I need to get a wider ribbon to support the weight of them, then I can always switch that out. So I'm going to start with this because that's all I have for now. Okay, so I'm going to start with this bigger middle one here, and let me see how we want to do this one. I think. Oh, you know what? Oh, that's it. That's it right there. Yep, that's it, okay. It fits perfectly because it has these aerial roots that wrap around that way, so it leans actually on that on that pose perfectly. Let's go ahead and tie this one up too. This is kind of like the next larger one. So we'll tie that one right about here. So what I'm doing is I'm just training these slowly over time, so I'm not gonna make them, I'm not gonna try to like lift them real tight to the pole right now if they don't wanna go that way, because I wouldn't wanna snap a vine. I just, like, I wanna, I want to gently guide it towards the pole or guide it in the direction you want it to grow if you want them to start growing upwards. So I'm just going to gently start to straighten it, but if it doesn't want to go all the way, then I'm not going to force it. And you can always tighten your floral ribbons or your ties later on, you know, as it starts to want to move in that direction. So we're just training, training the vines and we can always adjust them a little tighter as they start to go more upright. Okay, I've got a couple of vines on this side that are really leaning because we've got this fan fan action here, which actually I kind of like. It's very it's very wild, but I'm still gonna just help those just a little bit, just guide them upwards, maybe like something like that. Okay, so we'll go and tie those just to guide them. In ca in case they decide they wanted to climb the stake, we'll just give them a little help. Okay, so that's all I'll do for that side, and then over here, I think we'll just do this one here pretty much the main heavy one on this side, the heaviest vine. Uh, that should work. Okay, I just realized this vine here, we already tied it, but we're gonna tie it up one once more a little bit higher, so we wanna catch this higher one and have that growing up right. So we'll add one more tie up here, just a little bit higher. 
Okay, so we've got it repotted, we've got some of the vines staked up and supported, and now it's time to do some pruning on these yellowing and dying leaves, and then any other leaves that look a little, you know, maybe they're a little shabby looking, and you don't want those on there, you can do any trimming you want. Also, what you can do if you're repotting, if you wanna break up the root ball and like separate out or do some propagation, when you're doing a repot, that's a good time to do that too. So like for example, like some wonky pieces, if, if you have some awkward pieces on your plant, you could just remove that entirely and propagate it and have a whole new plant that you can train up how you want it. Um, so we could have done that on like this one here, but I'm sort of just leaving this all wild right now and uh, we can always you know propagate more off of this plant in the future. But right now I'm just gonna take my sterilized pruning shears and I'm just gonna cut off some of these, these yellowing leaves under here. So we don't need those on there. And we got one under here. Oh, we'll go and trim that one back too. Okay, so for dusting the leaves, I just use a regular microfiber cloth. So when we dust the leaves, we're actually allowing the plant to be able to photosynthesize with that leaf. If it had the layer of dust on it and we just left it on there, it wouldn't be able to photosynthesize the way that it needs to. So that's why we want to keep them clean and I try to do it on a regular basis, usually about once a week. I try to go around and dust all the house plants. Okay, now our plant is ready for a drink of water. So I'm gonna feed it at the same time. So I'm gonna do a little bit of fertilizing with you guys here too, and I'll show you what I use. So I normally switch back and forth between a couple of different ways of fertilizing. I will either use a liquid fertilizer, um, like this Eleanor's VF11. I really like this one. It's been good for all kinds of house plants. So they seem to really thrive with it. And so I got that at EcoGrow here in Tucson. Um, so I will add normally like one tablespoon to my little my little uh, watering can here, which is, this is just a half gallon. Um, so that's half strength of this. Normally you would add two tablespoons to one gallon and go ahead and water that way. Another option that sometimes I'll do when I first do a transplant like this or a repot is I'll just take a few handfuls of worm castings and those are highly nutrient uh, dense for the plants and they love it. So I will sprinkle that around the top of the soil and as you water, it kind of works its way down into the soil, into the roots and all those nutrients get soaked up by the roots and they love it, they just go crazy. Um, but since I already have my Eleanor's VF11 mixed in here, we're just gonna go ahead and water and I've we got my little saucer down there that the pot is in. Okay, I'm actually gonna mix up another can of this because it's really thirsty, so I'm gonna make sure I get the pot pretty evenly and really soak it. All right, so I'm gonna mix this one up with you guys. So here's the Eleanor's VF11. And so you can measure this if you want, just one tablespoon for a half gallon or two tablespoons for one whole gallon. But I just kind of eyeball it and just do a tiny, a tiny splash like that. And then I fill my watering can with water. And this, this Brita is just specifically for my plants. So it's pretty old and beat up, but I still use it for them just to try to filter out some of that chlorine. But whenever possible, I do use rainwater, but I just don't have any right now, so we're just gonna do some filtered water for it. We'll give it a drink of water. And I'm really gonna soak the pot because I know how thirsty this plant has been. So let's give this a good spray down. So it got fed, it got a good drink of water or a good water bath, and we're gonna give it a nice spray of water just to refresh its leaves after being cleaned and they love water monsters just like really seem to perk up what is this brand delta sprayer so that's my, my little hand sprayer this thing's been so handy for so many plant projects but these aeroids the monsters they really love getting a good spray it's just like they're at home in the rainforest again getting a nice misting from the rain they get all that humidity from it. Also spraying the stems is a good way to kind of wake up the roots and create more humidity underneath for the plant. So instead of just spraying the leaves. So for the aeroids, I spray them every day, twice a day. And I find that when I'm on that schedule, uh, cause sometimes I'll slack a little or I'll forget or something, I'll miss a few days. But when I'm on that schedule twice a day, morning and night, it seems like they really perk up and they really do well with that. So right now, this one you can see its leaves are kind of curved. This one's this one's perkier, but when they start to curve like that, that's from uh, dehydration or uh, the humidity is not as high as they would like it to be, so it causes them to dry out more. 
warmer and faster. So its day at the spa is just about done, but it's in its nursery pot and we need to fix that. So we're gonna put that into something so it can feel pretty. We're gonna give it a little outfit. So I'm going to go look for a basket or something decorative to be able to set it in. Um, I don't know if this pot will slide inside the pot it was already in. I don't think so. I think it might be too close to the same size, but we'll see. Okay, so I was looking at a couple different options and one of them was reusing the pot that it was in, but just putting the nursery pot inside of that. It almost looked like it would fit. This is the same size nursery pot as, as, as we put it in, but not quite. So uh, plan B was to use a basket. So let me show you guys the basket that I have. All right, here it is. It is a huge basket. Now, the thing is, whenever you're using a basket for your plants, you have to cover the bottom of it with plastic or vinyl or something that is waterproof. Even if you have a saucer, it can still kind of penetrate the saucer. Um, not necessarily leak, but it still has like moisture. So it'll still create like a moist environment inside the basket. So I always try to make sure I line it as best as I can. So you can use any kind of plastic, even like a trash bag, uh, or vinyl, you can, you know, anything that you can just line it with, it's non-porous where the water's not gonna get through or the moisture's not gonna get through and mold your basket. So I just have trash bags for right now, so I'm just gonna use one of those and put that around the bottom and up around the edges a little. Um, and I was gonna actually go to either like Lowe's or Home Depot and grab one of those drop cloths. They have plastic drop cloths that are pretty inexpensive and you can cut those apart and use those as liners too. They're a nice, thick, sturdy plastic. So now I'm gonna put the saucer in here and that's gonna sit on the bag. Oh, I forgot to mention your saucer. A good way to get the water out of your saucer so your plant won't be in standing water is to use a turkey baster. So you can just suck that right out. I actually learned that tip from Plantarina. I love her on here. She is awesome. She has such great tips. And that is one that came from her. So I really appreciate that. Her name is Amanda on Plantarina. Definitely check her out if you don't know her already. She's awesome. All right, here's the test. Let's see how it looks. Let's see if I can even get in here without <laughs> disturbing the branches too much. I I kind of I kind of love this, but it's it's cracking me up at the same time because the basket is so huge and that, like it's so wide and the plant is so wide too. So actually, I think they're a good match. I mean, they look absurd, but I think they fit well together. <laughs> Okay, so now I need to figure out exactly where this is gonna go because now it's it's like gigantic, gigantosaurus. And <laughs> I don't know if I've got a place for it. Okay, you guys, um, hold on. Let me let me take a look around the house and see where I can fit this thing. You know, I just realized this leaf down here. That's that's gonna have to go because it's just like hanging down there, so weird. So let's go ahead and trim that one back. And let's just kind of fix those two. Okay, so I looked around the house and the best place I can find for this plant because it is large and I do want it to have as bright of indirect light as I can give it, I think right here is where it's gonna have to live, right in our dining room area. Well, actually our dining room got pushed, pushed that way. This is now like my plant office. Um, so right at our big dining room windows here, this is the east facing side of our house. So these are east facing windows and it gets bright light all day long. Um, we have a patio out here and the light, the sunlight bounces off that right through the window all day. So it stays really bright. Um, so I'm thinking because I want this plant to grow as big as possible. I want it to, you know, really mature and start putting out, you know, nice big leaves with beautiful intricate fenestrations. I want that to get enough light so it can start producing those. So I'm gonna have it here and see how that works. If I need to kind of like shift, you know, shift directions or move it a little closer on one side of the window or something, I'll figure that out later. But I think it's gonna live right here by this window. So I'm gonna try it on the east side of our house and it does get lots of bright light at the back part of our house, which is the south facing side. So that gets lots of sunlight coming in those windows though. And it's and the rooms themselves are hotter because of that. So actually when I put, I had this one back here before, or back there before, and it got um, it got a little bit sunburned. I'll, I'll bring you guys in closer and show you. Even though I had it pulled several feet away from the window, the sun would just like peek in. And I'll show you a really tender spot where they tend to get sunburned. And if you see this happening, you'll know that um, it's either dehydrated or most likely it got too much sun, even filtered sunlight coming in on there. Now these plants, when it comes to water, 
watering. They like consistent moisture. They don't want to dry out all the way. At least that's been my experience. If I let them go even slightly dry, they start getting very limp. Their, their stems will start to curve downwards. And so when it comes to your watering schedule, my schedule might look different than your schedule. Um, but I'll go ahead and share like how often I water during different times of the year, just to give you an idea. So during the summertime, the hottest months of the year, I will water at least twice a week, sometimes three times a week if I'm noticing, you know, it looks a little limp or the leaves got a little too warm or something and they start to, you know, droop. So I normally water by what it looks like. Now this plant, I just watered it yesterday and so I can still feel it has plenty of moisture in there, but it'll start getting lighter and lighter as it starts to dry. And so normally I will, <laughs> I will kind of pay attention to how the leaves look and that's how I water. So when I go to water, I'll water the entire plant pot really well. I'll really saturate that soil all throughout and until it's running through the bottom of the pot. So that's normally how I water just about every single time. So I don't do like little, little tiny sips of water. You know, I really just soak the pot. And when it comes to watering during the rest of the year, like winter time, these plants are not in their growing season. Um, so there's not normally a need to water them a whole lot. So I water them maybe once a month. And during spring and fall, if it's a little bit cooler, then normally the soil is, again, not drying out very quickly. So I'll water it maybe once every two weeks or so. And then if it's hotter during those uh, seasons, then I end up watering maybe once a week. So hopefully that makes sense. But it basically all has to do with how fast your soil is drying out. And that's going to be different for everyone. It's going to depend on the soil you're using, the type of pot you're using, and also your humidity level and uh, just your overall climate. And I don't let them go bone dry because they get very upset if you let them go too dry. At least that's what I found in my experience. So I try to keep them a little bit moist and I just water when like the top couple inches of the soil has gone dry. But I really tend to water by how the plant looks. So if the leaves are not as glossy, if they start to look a little more dull, you know that they're starting to lose their hydration, they're starting to get a little more dehydrated, and so normally I will water them. And then the next level of dehydration is when you see the leaves going limp or the stems are starting to really go limp, then you know they're definitely dehydrated and could really use a good soaking. And I normally try to repot when the plant is fully hydrated. So I will water it and then during that week is when I repot it. It just helps the plant go through that transition period of shock of being transplanted. It helps it go through that period a little bit easier because they do take some time to get settled into their new pot and start taking up water. So I had an idea to use my essential oil diffuser just temporarily until I get a humidifier. And so I'm using my Vitruvi essential oil diffuser down there and I didn't put any essential oils in there. It's just plain water running right now. So I'm hoping that will help them out a little bit with the dry air. So when is the best time to repot these guys? It's gonna be their growing season. So that's normally the warmer months where they're putting out new leaves. So when you see them actively growing, that's a good time of year to repot. Now, how often to repot these? Usually the guideline is every couple of years, but there's no set rules. If you want to repot it or if you feel like it's outgrowing its pot or you just want to change the pot or the soil that it's in and you want to refresh it, then you can repot it anytime during the growing season any year. Um, I like to repot mine if I notice them kind of outgrowing the pot or if they seem to be getting tight. Now, these can grow root bound but they will grow bigger and faster if you give them a little extra space. Last year I did an experiment where I had two monsteras that were the same age and the same size. One I kept in its original nursery pot, so it was a little bit root bound, and then the other one I up potted into a much larger pot and it filled out that pot really quickly. It also got uh, stronger, thicker vines, uh, like thicker stems on the, the leaves. Um, everything was just growing a lot faster compared to the one that I kept in its original nursery pot. But the one in the original smaller nursery pot, it did still fill out the pot and it did still produce a lot of leaves. But I noticed that the stems were just a little thinner and a little weaker. So it just wasn't as big and thick um, as the one that I up potted into the larger pot. So hopefully that makes sense. But yeah, if you up pot them into a pot that's a few inches larger or at least a couple inches larger, they will fill out that pot and they'll get big and strong and they'll start putting out bigger leaves and more fenestrations and everything. They just seem to have more growth overall. Now this was mostly just a casual repot video, but I also wanted to include a couple of troubleshooting tips. So things that you might notice that could be happening with your Monstera. 
One is yellowing leaves, and yellowing leaves can be caused by dehydration, so not being watered enough, or the soil isn't retaining enough moisture, or it could be caused by overwatering. So the, the yellowing of the leaves, it can look a little bit different though between being dehydrated versus being overhydrated or overwatered. And there is another reason that yellowing leaves can occur, and that is smaller leaves that are down underneath its canopy where it's not getting enough light. So sometimes the plant will just cut those off and you'll just see some small yellowing leaves that are just kind of tucked down under the rest of the foliage. And that's totally normal if they were not receiving enough light. The plant isn't using them for photosynthesis and they're just taking energy from the plant and so it will just cut those off basically and they will yellow and crispen up and fall off the plant. So uh, dehydration is very similar to that. It will lose the lower leaves, the, the least important leaves or the, the leaves that are not as much of a priority for the plant. So that happens also with dehydration. Now, if it's been overwatered, you're gonna see yellowing leaves and possibly browning leaves higher up on the plant. So it's not just gonna be the little smallest leaves under the canopy, it's gonna be bigger leaves that are more of a priority for the plant but it just can't deal with the amount of water that it's received and it's overhydrated. You might even see some really dark, um, almost like leaf burn marks and that is from being overwatered usually. Sometimes it can come from sunlight hitting the leaves too. Also uh, something else that can happen with leaf burn uh, is if they've been over fertilized, they can get leaf burn that way also. You may still have a chance to save the plant. You just have to unpot it, clean up the roots and we can always do a different video on that in the future if you want help with that. Okay, I just want to show you down here this leaf sheath. It's a very delicate part of the plant's tissue. That's where the, the new leaves come out of. Let me show you over here. You might be able to see a better example. Here we go. So here's a leaf sheath. Very delicate, very thin plant tissue. And then here is a leaf sheath that has sun damage on it. And it's crispy, it has yellowed, and it's also brown and crispy there. So that is from just a little bit of dappled sunlight or filtered sunlight coming in the window. And it was not right next to the window either. This plant was about seven feet away, pulled back from any windows. So it just took the tiniest bit of sun coming in and it was just early morning sun too. And it still burned that part of the plant. So I just wanted to show you that some mistakes that I've made and have learned from. So just watch out, even if you just have a little bit of filtered sunlight coming in and you think it's pretty gentle, for these plants it can be too much and so you just want to watch out for that if you live in a place where you have strong sunlight and here's another one on this side you can see how that's yellowed there and there's even a little bit of yellow there and how it's crispy poor little baby got too much sun and i wanted to show you guys the plant that we potted up let's get right in here can you guys see those aerial roots so there's one right here and then one right down there and they just happen to grab on perfectly up against the stake and so it's been a couple days since we repotted this I just want to do a little update here this top leaf of that line already started moving towards the stake where we had tied it and I already had to tighten up the, the artificial sinew I was using, my twine, because it was super loose. It wasn't even like holding it anymore. It, it just had moved that much in just a couple days time. Uh, browning of leaf tips. Let me see if I can find uh, one of my plants that has the browning tips. Hold on one sec. Does that one have any? Oh, you know what? Let's go to the other one in my back room. So hopefully you're able to see that. So we've got a little bit of a brown kind of crispy tip there. The heat back here is just too hot. So I have to move it out of this room. It's going to go in the front with the others and I'm going to repot it. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to show you the browning. That is from dehydration where the leaves are losing too much moisture and they're not able, like the moisture is not able to make it all the way to the tips, if that makes sense. So the moisture ends up evaporating before it can fill the entire leaf. So sometimes those brown crispy tips can be caused by dehydration and other times it could be a deficiency of some kind. It has different reasons and usually there's you know a variety of causes for any given you know symptom that your plant might be experiencing. Just like the yellowing leaves you know can have different causes but normally if you see one sign, there will be other signs that kind of also kind of give you a hint to what's going on. All right, so I just wanted to show you guys that, but yes, this poor baby is next. I'm actually gonna do this one right now. So I'm not gonna film it though, cause you guys already had to watch uh, one filming, one potting, and there's a big old root there, big old aerial root I gotta watch out for. 
and also in their natural habitat when these plants are climbing up trees, they can become disconnected to their main root system, and then these aerial roots actually become their main primary root system. So they're very important. They're much more than just a support for the plant. They actually take in oxygen, and eventually they can take in nutrients and water. Um, they're just a very important part to the plants. So I always try to leave those alone and protect them whenever I'm repotting. And humidity really affects these plants quite a bit too. So up here you can see these limp leaves. These are the newest leaves on this plant and you can see how limp they are and how curved the leaves can become. That's from lack of humidity, so dry air can do that. So if you want your leaves to be as perky as possible, then uh, we're gonna have to get a humidifier. <laughs> That's just how it's gonna go. So I've got limp leaves, I got dry air, dry hot air, and I'll get a humidifier for them as soon as I can and that should fix that problem and they will perk back up. Um, but otherwise, yeah, it's not something to worry about, you know, but if you can give them a little more moisture, they will have perkier leaves for sure. All right, you guys, thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this video helpful and I love you. Have an awesome day and I wish you the best success in growing your plants. Bye guys.